umpires that do like high school ages and all this they're like 12 u baseball i said just come talk to me after you step off that 12 u field it's wild and it's it's unreal i mean the kids they make it look so easy what's up everybody welcome back to another episode here on youth inc um this week we have a really fun um episode for you guys as as you know listeners of the show you guys realize that especially this time of year in the summer um, both my boys play travel baseball uh, just got back I kind of chronicle those crazy weekends uh, every Monday here on the show a couple weekends ago we told you we went down to the perfect game uh, invitational the World Series event down in Sanford Florida 27 teams from all over the country um, were there for six days played seven games it was it was a great experience for the boys you know, so I, I've I've talked a lot about what that travel experience is like, and we and we've talked to a lot of other families, you know, the, the munices about what that was like in the you know the travel soccer world and you know basketball and whatnot. But um, you know, right now my kids do more of that travel element in baseball, and you know whether that continues or it goes to another sport, we will see. But you know that perfect game um, organization has really taken over the the baseball scene. They're now getting into softball. Um, so we just thought it was really appropriate. I, instead of just me kind of relaying and talking, we, we were able to have uh, Tony Harper, who's their youth um, operations director. He's at every one of these big showcases, every one of these big tournaments all around the country. And uh, he kind of runs the show for Perfect Game. So had a chance to meet Tony um, down in Florida a couple weeks back when we were there. And he was kind enough to join us for this week's episode. So I think just to hear from him, right? When, when people talk about, you know, is, is youth sports becoming a little too professionalized? Is it too expensive? You know, when is too much, too much for 10 year olds to be, you know, flying as guest players in to tournaments across the country and play. So I think it was important for us to kind of pose a lot of those questions to him, understand just what perfect games, um, you know, ultimate objective is as they try to grow access and grow, you know, the game of baseball at the youth level. So it was a it was a great conversation. Um, I, I think it was one that really shed light into what's becoming a a, a real player in, in the youth sports scene. Um, you know, specifically right now in baseball and 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 a little bit in softball. So I hope you guys enjoy today's episode here on You Think with Perfect Game Youth Operations Director Tony Harper. Tony Harper, I'd like to welcome you here to uh, to You Think, and I appreciate you taking a couple minutes to come chat. Yeah, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. First of all, you know, big, big fan of you. I appreciate you guys supporting and, you know, giving back to the youth baseball community. So it's fun seeing you out there. I know the kids love seeing you out there as well. So I really appreciate that. And thank you for having me on. Yeah, I, I appreciate you coming on. And, um, you know, as I was saying, kind of in the intro, Tony, everyone in Charlotte and everyone who listens to you think is well aware of our weekend travels through this whole baseball scene. And, and we're going to, and we're going to dive into that. But before we do, I just want to kind of paint the picture a little bit of your background. You're an you know, accomplished player in your own right. Catcher played for a while, played professionally, dealt with some ups and downs, just kind of paint the picture of your early childhood experience. You know, what was that road that led you now to, you know, for a job to give back and, and service this, this youth baseball community across the country. But what was your youth baseball or just youth sports experience growing up, um, you know, for you personally? Yeah, it's, you know, started out a uh, little league path, uh, got kind of experienced with a travel ball um, deal. And I, to be honest, I think travel ball is a, a whole new animal compared to what it was um, back when I was playing. But uh, just, you know, continue to develop, uh, decided to go the youth route, uh, love giving back to the kids, love seeing their 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 path of you know starting out eight nine ten um and just develop and keep continuing to play um just i think one of my favorite things is just seeing the the interaction of the kids and i i tell the kids all the time you know i i go to major league baseball games see see kids play together and you know somewhere down the path those kids their roads crossed you know they were all on a travel ball team whether it was together against each other at some point so it's really fun to you know, just hear each and every different kid's story. Um, you know, everybody has a different background. Some some kids have a little bit harder path to getting to, you know, the show. Some of these kids might not ever make it to the show. But, you know, they learn a lot of life lessons through uh, youth sports. And I think it's great um, that kids have the opportunity, especially 
uh, with the platform that Perfect Game uh, gives these kids um, to really expose themselves. Um, you can go on Perfect Game's website, look up Mike Trout, see what Mike Trout did. You can check out his stats from when he played Perfect Game, uh, when he was doing the showcases and all that. So that's, you know, that's why I really got involved in that. I wanted to give back to kids. I love, love hanging out with the kids. As you say, I got a pretty good little social media following. So the kids, the kids really connect with me and I really enjoy what I do. <laughs> Yeah. So let's just paint the picture. I mean, to me and to anyone out there who has a kid playing uh, travel baseball, perfect game is the, is the association, right? That's the big events, the showcases, the travel weekends, the, the whole thing. But maybe for those of, you know, for the families that are listening to coaches that maybe don't have a, a you know, a, a, a child playing in PG or playing competitive baseball, like just paint the picture of like, what is the, the objective? What is the mission behind perfect game as you guys crisscross the country all summer long, putting on these events and showcases, like at its core, how would you classify like the purpose and the mission behind perfect game? So the travel baseball, perfect game's a little different than probably what a lot of people are exposed to on ESPN and little league, because little league, they have, what they do is they recruit from a local area. So your little city, city within each other, those kids are the top kids from within that city. So perfect game, we have no boundaries. So basically teams can go out, they can grab kids, the top kids in your case would be the top kids in North Carolina, South Carolina, put those kids on a team. And they really have the opportunity to go up and go head to head with other teams across the country. Um, starting at the youth age, we don't really do showcases. We don't rank players. The The real goal is, you know, just to get these kids exposed to top other talents, develop, practice. Um, it's cool for, you know, a lot of times I tell people, hey, you might be, you're basically a small fish in a big pond. And to be able to travel the country and see the top arms, the top kids at a, you know, a younger age group really helps those kids and gives them the drive to go to work, work on their craft and get better every day. But as we get to the high, the high school ages, uh, we have showcases. We have where kids can sign up, they can come out, they can get evaluated. Um, we rank players, we rank teams. Um, we have select festivals. We have national showcases, which are basically individual events for kids that compete at our events and um, give them recognition for all their hard work. So it's a it's a little different animal. I know people see Little League World Series and they're like, oh, that's those kids are amazing, which, you know, and given the right, there's a lot of kids that play travel ball that also play Little League, too. But it's it's kind of like a whole new animal when you you don't really have those boundaries and kids can kind of teams can reach from all different areas um, to pick up kids. I know you've probably seen it. Um, you've, you, you've been in some pretty competitive games. You guys were down at our world series in Atlanta, big shout out to the guys in Atlanta that put on that show. And then we had you guys down at Boomba and Sanford for the PG invitational. And just to have teams from all over the country, from California to Miami to, you know, just a little bit of a little feel from all the different areas and get those kids to go head to head. It's just fun to watch, man. It's, it's definitely, it's, it's hard to even put in words how talented these kids are at such a young age. I, I say that to people all the time when they ask me, they're like, you're traveling for 10 year old baseball. I said, I promise you come watch our practice. Come watch any of our tournament games locally where it would blow your mind how good these kids are. Right. And, and, and like, it's hard to describe it to other people who aren't in it. Right. They think of what they remember 10 year old baseball to look like. And it was, it was just something to do on a, on a Saturday morning, but like, I don't think people truly grasp it, but you brought up a couple interesting points that I, that I want to talk to you about that. I, I find, you know, obviously we decide to go, our team decides to go out there and seek this high level of competition. If you don't like it, I always say to people, if you don't like it, no one's forcing you to go do it. Right. So, but along those lines, there is a lot of uh, you know, criticism of the, of the model, right. Which I, I find myself defending quite often that if it's the best for your kid and your kid can handle it both mentally, physically, he can compete. It's a, it's something your family's willing to sacrifice to go do. Then why would you limit those opportunities for your kid? But so then, but on the other side of that coin, the, the feedback and the pushback that we get is when is too young? When is it too much too young? 
right? These kids are 10, they're showcases, they're trying out for all state games. You know, you're combining multiple teams from across different states to come make like a super team to fly down to Florida and play. And, and there's a lot of people that say, we're kind of losing the, the innocence and the, and the, the purity of what youth sports should be about, which should be the development. Like what is, what is your slash perfect games response to that? I, I know how I respond to it and push back, but I, I'd be curious, how do you, how do you guys combat the people that say, oh, well, you can just draw kids from all over the country. You don't really have a full-time team. You just get guest players to make your team the best. It's really to service the adults, the coaches, their ego. Like, how do you guys combat that? Yeah, we actually, we have different classifications for baseball. So we we have our major level, which is our top, top level. And those are usually the teams that travel around to do the bigger events that seek the top kids in different areas. And we also have AAA all the way down to double a so it's kind of like your your baseball your minor league system so it's kind of your double a would probably be more along your rec league where you know if you're just now kind of getting your feet wet with the travel ball um deal you can play at a double a level and those kids can play against local talent um a lot of times the double a teams are like your hometown teams so they basically you know we have bigger national events for the double a triple a but it's kind of what you you get kind of what you want to put into it. I mean, if, if you want to put your kid in that pressure situation, which I, I think, you know, at a young age, if, you know, your kid strives to take it to the next level, level down the road, then, hey, yeah, take that major route. But, you know, if you if you're in it for just fun, you know, you want to hang out with friends, have something to do on the weekends, then, yeah, I mean, explore the double A, triple A version. Um, but I think it's. You know, and I tell people all the time, like, yeah, major levels competitive. I mean, it's the games are intense. Um, but, you know, I also tell parents all the time, you, you can't you can't lose sight of what it is. And it's a game and it's a game where you want the kids to be challenged, develop, have a good time. And sometimes parents do put a lot of pressure on kids at such a young age. And I and I have to remind them, like, hey, don't lose sight of this because you don't want to take the fun out of it for your kid. Because the 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 goal is the long time longevity of the game. And I know a lot of times kids are forced to practice and all this like you can't force it. If a kid wants it, they're going to put what they want into it. So I think it's. You know, there's different avenues for what you're wanting to get into it. I mean, of course, the major level is what I'm I deal with the most. I deal with the big national showcases so I or the national events. So I see a lot of the high intense games. I see I've seen some crazy stuff. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've seen <laughs> nine and 10 year olds getting flown in. I mean, I you know, it goes on and on. And, it, and to be honest, it's not for everybody. And it's no, you know. It's not. And so I'll paint the, you know, so just for those listening, I'll paint the picture. So we go down a couple weeks ago to Sanford. So in order, and, and correct me if I have any of this wrong. So there's 27 teams from all over the country, California, Florida, Texas, Louisiana, Car Carolina, of course, Florida, all the way across. All right. So along the way of the season, starting in the spring, you have to qualify in order to be eligible to bring your team from your organization to this. And so there's team, there's tournaments going on every weekend throughout the entire country. But now Tony, only certain tournaments winning a certain tournament to qualify for these big invitationals. Not every tournament along the way is created equal. Correct. 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 We have super regionals across the country. Um, I think last year we had 40 and those are basically our top level events. And that those events are when you're usually going to drag in those top teams. So to get to the PG Invitational National Championship, you have to win one of those. So a lot of times you have teams that win those that are their records are crazy. They're like 55 and two. So it's kind of like a, a all the top teams in the country getting together on the field, you know, None of them are used to losing. None of them like to lose. And it's it's just a straight up, every game means something. Yeah, and we played in a few of them. We went out in March. We went to the Texas. The one out in Houston is a huge NIT in Texas. Teams from all over the country came out. We went out there um, back in March. Of course, there's the one here in Charlotte. So, so anyway, so fast forward to this weekend. So 27 teams come from all over the country and they play. And you play 
pool play games and then the top teams from pool play, everyone wants to make the gold bracket, right? So you, you want to win in your pool play and you want to make the gold bracket. And then once you do starts like a double elimination kind of college world series ish type style, double elimination. So we draw a team from Houston in the first round of the bracket. They ended up winning the entire thing, but this leads me to my next question. And you kind of already touched on it. We're playing a team from Houston who's half the roster is not from the state of Texas. That's so right. I guess, so my question to you is, you know, meanwhile, we brought 10 of our kids play every, we brought nine kids from Charlotte. We have one kid that used to live in Charlotte. He now lives in Florida, but he plays every tournament with us. His family brings him and he still plays with the team he did from, from a young age. So we had those 10 and then to add an extra kid, we added one friend of his from Florida. That was our like true guest player, right? So that was our 11 man roster. Nine of our 11 kids live within 15 miles of each other in Charlotte. We're now playing a team out of Houston, which is huge to begin with. And like I said, half their roster isn't from the state of Texas, let alone Houston, Louisiana, California, New York, wherever it is. So you touched on it before. Like, is there ever a conversation to truly find out the best team? Because the best team that sh the best teams who showed up last weekend, that was not the roster that qualified them earlier in the year that they add kids from other teams who don't qualify to bump their team. So I guess my question is, as you guys lay out this, this path throughout the year that ends with this big national championship collection of the top teams, is there ever conversations internally to say, okay, on a certain date, you got to freeze a roster. Kids can't be rostered on 15 different teams and then just hop around and play fly in last minute on Sunday to pitch the championship, but they weren't there in pool play. Like, are those all conversations that you guys have, or is your philosophy like, Hey, you sign up for this, you make your team, you show up, we don't care. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I hear those concerns from parents and coaches all the time, but it's like people think that adding kids to a roster is an advantage. I think a hometown team that has 10 kids that play together every tournament, I think they're at an advantage, period. Because, one, you're going into a tournament with experience with your teammates. The coaches know what they have. You practice together. You have plays. You have all this stuff. So it's like the team that adds players – you gotta you gotta be able to mold and play as a team. So I mean, I see both sides of it, and you know, for this kind of event, we don't freeze rosters. You know, if you want to pick up a kid, and it would be tough to roll through a double elimination tournament with 10 and 11 kids. Cause I know once you get that down in that loser's bracket, it's a battle. It's a battle. And yeah. Oh, it's absolute grind. And you know, it's hot and all this. So we do allow um teams to pick it up and we don't really um police the rosters i mean it's there's different models but we're kind of hey you know we want to see the top kids you know yeah. a lot of these kids teams don't qualify and those those top kids deserve to be on a top level team to be able to be seen play against the other top kids in the country so we don't really freeze rosters we don't all do that we want to see the top kids we want to see the top teams the top kids go head to head and like i said just because you know, you're a hometown team. Your team has honestly clearly got an advantage over these kids that pick up three or four kids the week before. And, you know, they don't mold. They don't they don't click. And I, I think there's a lot to that. Yeah, I know. I, I, I agree with a lot of that. You know, you mentioned you have your plays, you have your signs, you have your it, it's just it's hard to compete when they can just throw arm after arm after arm. Right. They're on their seventh game and they're throwing a starting pitcher. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's a little bit different. And, but, but again, my take anytime people on you know, our parents or any, any other parents or you, even myself, you say, oh, this is bullshit. This isn't fair. That kid's not even on this team, blah, blah, blah. Then don't come. Yeah. That, that's always what it all comes down to at the end of the day. And I have to remind myself, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. If you're going to yeah. show up and complain and moan and, and fight, then go play a different tournament. That's the, yeah. this, and you I, know what I mean? So I, 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 I get it. I, I totally get it, but I'll tell you what, next year I want to make our team better. Cause I want to come down there and fucking win. You know what I mean? Like I get <laughs> it. I, it's, it's super competitive and you can't help, but like really buy into it, especially because you see how much the kids just like thrive and love it. You know? Yeah. I think, and a lot of people lose sight of 
what i mean yeah wins losses that's great everybody wants to win nobody likes to lose but at the end of the day it's it's about getting your kid exposed getting your kid better yep. so ha- running up against i mean i don't know what kind of arms y'all were 10 you so you probably saw some 60 some low yeah, 60s low maybe 60s. mid 60s yeah, 60s yeah yeah but i mean to see that at you know 46 feet i mean just this past weekend we had our 12 you and we had a kid throwing 84 yeah. Yeah, one of our, and our I, you, you don't see yeah, that. our organization here in Charlotte, the SBA National Marucci team, they're out of Charlotte and they were down there in your big 12. I think they made it to like the semis or whatever and lost to, um, I think that TGD backs or that Scottsdale team or yeah. whoever, one of those teams that made the championship. And uh, it's real ball now. We go watch these kids. They're 12 years old, throwing 85 miles an hour. It's yeah. Intense. And I, it's a joke because I talk with some of the umpires and the umpires that do like, high school ages and all this they're like 12 u baseball i said just come talk to me after you step off that 12 u field it's wild and it's it's unreal i mean the kids they make it look so easy i mean they they, they're just so fundamentally sound i mean they're the coaches are intense the the games are intense the parents are intense i mean that tgd backs that zt national prospects sba i mean it, those teams are just so competitive and it brings out the top kids and it's fun to watch. I mean, every, every weekend it's, you know, anybody can win. I mean, it's just, it's, it's the, it's so fun to watch. And I'm so blessed to have this job and be able to see these kids at such a young age. And I tell them, I'm like, Hey, you know, you're sharing the field with somebody that's going to make it. Yeah. And, And I tell my kid all the time, again, he's 10 or he just turned 11, but you know, playing 10 U I said, you know, and when people ask like, why, again, why do you do this? Right. The question of why. And I said, you know what? I do it because my kid a wants to do it and B, you know what? I want my kid to go down there to Florida and take the mound against the Puerto Rican elite team or the banditos or gold culture from Louisiana. Like one of these big, big teams where they got just stud after stud and he's going to take the mound and he's going to go out there and he's going to get hit. He's going to give up a walk. He's going to have, and he's got to bear down and he's got to get a strikeout. And he's right. Like he's going to have to go out there and work. If we just stayed here in Charlotte and he played, you know, all stars or challenge, whatever it is, he would get on the mound. And for four years leading up to middle school ball, he would strike out 10 guys a game. No one would hit him. And he'd think he was a hero. But then all of a sudden you get to middle school, high school ball, and you start playing against other kids that have been playing travel their whole lives. And all of a sudden you face your first adversity as a junior in high school and you come across some team that's, and now you're 17 facing adversity versus 10. So like, I'm a big believer. Like I want my kid on the mound against the best team. I want my kid, like I want them to feel that pressure and feel what it takes to play competitive sports, but I want them to feel it at a young age so they can learn to deal with it. So by the time they're in high school, by the time they're older, it's not their first time failing. It's not their first time giving up the game winning home run. Like these are all life experiences that personally for me, I believe it's best to have your kids experience at a younger age because it builds that, it builds that callus. It builds that toughness and resiliency that now it doesn't break them one day down the road. Cause they haven't experienced failure until they were 16 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to, guys that you know kids go off to high school and everything and they say travel ball really sets their tone for when they get to high school because they say it it's almost as if it's like a step back like the game almost slows down when they get to high school and it's not until you get to that varsity level that you're really pushed and i think it's good for kids to you know i tell people all the time if you're the best player on your team you're on the wrong team like go get challenged. Like if you're the best player on the field, you're on the wrong field because until you start challenging, challenging yourself and pushing yourself to be a, become a better teammate, a better player and all that, then you, what are you really doing? Yep. And it's like I said, and I've stressed all the time. It's, it's the long term. It's not the, it's not the wins and losses. It's what you're taking out of that 10 you travel by baseball game. Absolutely. It's getting better, getting developed, pushing yourself and making sure you can overcome them tough moments that you're going to be faced with in life, even if it's not on the baseball field, because you're going to be challenged. You're absolutely going to be challenged. No question. If you're the best kid on your team or you're the worst kid on your team, you're on the wrong team. 
right? If you're the worst kid on the team, you got to find a team that you can get more reps and you can move up the pecking order and get more, de- again, because it's about development. To say you're on the best team, but you don't get to develop your skills, you're not helping anybody. That's the parent's ego that just says, oh, I want my kids on SBA or my kids on D, you know, ZT or my kids on, with all these teams. But then again, to your point, if your kid's the best team, the best kid on an inferior team, well, you're also doing him a disservice or her a disservice because they're not being challenged and pushed. I, I, I think that's great advice for our listeners. Uh, I, I've told this story on here before last year, my oldest kid was playing in those all state games down in Georgia and he, and the coastal team was playing the California team and he was pitching and he was down to like his lat, you know, you have your 75 pitch count rules and all that. And he had like one more batter. It was a tie game and his last batter, he's battling the kid, battling the kid, battling the kid. And he gives off a solo home run in like the fourth or fifth inning. That was his last pitch of the thing. So we had to take him out. He comes walking off the field and all I could say to him, I was like, buddy, you did, you were awesome. Like that kid hit a 265 yard, 260 foot home run. You battled your ass off against the best kids. Like I want my, what I'd rather him struck the kid out. Of course. But I'll tell you what, man, I was proud of him and I want him to have those moments now and not have them. Like you said, the first time he takes the field in varsity ball, I, I'm a big believer in that. And, um, we've covered a lot of that here on you think. Yeah. And also to feed off kind of what you were saying, I have a lot of parents that come to me and like, Hey, we're presented with playing on this team. Like, yeah, that's cool. They're, they're a top ranked team. You know, they, they're good. But what is your kid going to get out of that? Is your kid going to go play on that team and just ride the bench? Like, yep. what is that helping your kid? Like, don't help your ego by just saying, Oh, my kid's on this totally. team. Like put your kid in a position to succeed. No you know, question. it's all about reps getting better and going to ride a bench for the number one team in the country does not do your son any help in the long run. That's so true. That, that's great advice. I want to fast forward a little bit to some of the older kids. I know PG, ha, you know, has been around for a long time. The other night, you know, I'm watching the the MLB draft and, you know, all the kids that are getting drafted, you know, you guys are sharing it on all your social sites. And I found myself Googling or, you know, on the, on the perfect game site, searching, you know, Elijah green and, you know, all these kids that are being, um, that are being drafted at the top first round. And, and like you said, you can go back and see what they did at, you know, I think it goes back to like 12 U or 13 U or whatever it was. And you can go back and you can see how hard they threw what they did. So it's pretty cool to see what teams they played for, what tournaments and showcases they played in. You can almost track like from 12 years old, all the way till they were, they heard their name called in the draft. So I want to talk a little bit more about that block of kids, right? the 16 U, the 17 U kids that are getting ready to hope, you know, one day leave high school and go play in college or, you know, in some cases get drafted. Like that's always been a big kind of sweet spot for perfect games model, right? You guys hold a lot of these showcases. You hold a lot of the select fests, the, the national showcase games. Talk a little bit about the connection between perfect game and also the college recruiting process. And then for the very select few, the ability for these kids to be drafted out of high school and go on to play you know, and start their, you know, start the minor league climb and all that. So just talk a little bit about perfect games role in that for a young kid. Yeah. So perfect game hosts showcases all across the country. Um, there it's basically an opportunity for a kid to come out, um, run a 60 yard dash, be evaluated, um, get those hard numbers. Um, and we attach all those to each player that plays within perfect game has their own profile. You can go in, you can update a photo, you can do, you know, height, weight, all that deal. And those stats track them uh, across their whole career. Like your son, he played in the tournament last week and we have stats from that game. So we track literally dating back from all the way through 9U, all the way through their high school and college careers. When a kid commits to a college, we attach that to her profile. When a kid gets drafted in the Major League Baseball draft, you, we attach that to their profile. So we're basically a platform as well as a tournament body for kids to get exposed. Because if I'm a college coach and I'm like, Hey, you know, this tournament is in Hoover, Alabama this week, we have the 14 U WWB going BA going on in Alabama. And you know, the recruiting for baseball is getting younger and younger every year. I've seen kids commit or verbally commit out of eighth grade. And it, it's just crazy. And the and the thing is, is colleges have to be that aggressive because if they don't, somebody else is. 
And you have so many kids that go straight out of high school, skip college and go straight to the MLB draft. And it's, you know, you get a kid to commit, but at the end of the day, is he really going to end up playing with your school or is he going to take off to the draft? So it's, it's one of those things where we're the platform for colleges to be able to go see those hard numbers. Um, and they can see when a kid plays. So say, like I said, we have the tournament at Hoover. Alabama might say, oh, look at this. You know, PG has this top ranked kid. We give them a showcase number. Basically, it's a it's a grade for, you know, how we feel they hit uh, their defense, uh, their pitching and all that. And it gives the coach the opportunity to go see that kid. So we have tournaments in I wish I could pull up a picture, but we have tournaments where we have over a hundred colleges in attendance and they sit out there with golf carts, radar guns. And it's just unreal. Um, the opportunity they have. And I mean, yeah, you know, kids get seen at, at high school, but it's easier for a college coach to go to a travel baseball game and see 10 potential D one kids. Rather you go to a high school game and see one or two. You know, so it's a little bit it saves their time and it gives us the opportunity to really expose these kids and hopefully push them off to the next level. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. And and to your point, it's getting younger and younger, something we've we've kind of covered here with a lot of our different guests we've had on, you know, Roy Williams and and Mike Bray, the the head basketball coach at Notre Dame. And, and, um, you know, just listening to them. And I asked them that same question. I said, when you guys go recruit, you know, granted basketball, but same idea when you guys go recruit, like, where are you recruiting off of? And and they made that exact point. They said, you know, we do, I want to go watch him at his high school games, right? I want to see him interact with his teammates and his classmates and how he responds of being, you know, in our, you know, the kids we're recruiting are all the best player on their team. We want to see them in that environment because it's important because we also make it a point to go watch him on the summer travel circuit because we want to see him play in a game where he's not the best player. And we want to see him in a game where he doesn't score 25 points. So, you know, the, the baseball correlation would be, yeah, I could go watch the best high school pitcher in the country. And most of the time in his high school games, he's going to be dominant. Well, you go to one of these national showcase or one of these all American tournaments or one of the, one of these big events. And I could come watch that best high school pitcher is a top 10 prospect in the first inning. He might get shelled. How does he respond? What's his body language? So like I hear coaches say that all the time. And I think it's important for parents to realize when you're spending all this time trying to get your kids fastball and his batting, spend time on their body language, spend time on what do they look like when they have a bad thing? Cause when you go play a perfect game tournament, I don't care how good you are. You're going to come across a team that's got better kids than you. And if you're going to melt, these college coaches are going to see it and they're going to base a lot of their decisions more off that than they are based on your batting average. Yeah. And I tell, I try to stress it at a young age. It's, you know, body composure is huge in the game and that's, you know, yeah, a kid can probably run it up there to 90, 95, but you know, somebody's going to turn it around one day and it's, you know, how can you respond from giving up that bomb? Like, are you, are you just going to crumble and not be able to finish the inning? Or are you going to give up that home run and then turn around and be able to close out the inning? And it's, you know, I see it all the time, hear it all the time. It's, you know, it's, it's how they compose themselves, how they carry themselves on and off the field. Are they a good teammate? Like all these things like are things that parents can be working on now. Because once you get to that high school level, like some of these kids get stuck in their ways and you never know who's at those games. I mean, you never know who's a scout these days. I mean, every there's area scouts popping up everywhere. I mean, teams are, you know, you have to recruit and it, you never know who's watching. A lot of times they show up unannounced because that's that's when they, you get the best the best feel on a kid is when you just show up because you know, if you know, somebody's watching, of course you're going to do it, but it's, you never know who's watching. And a lot of times these guys show up and you better be on your a game every game because you could only have that one opportunity to be seen. All right. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm listening to this and I live in a part of the country where maybe there's not a big travel ball circuit team, but I got a kid who has college aspirations. He's 15, he's sophomore, whatever he is. And he, he doesn't play on a, on a travel summer team. That's good enough. Maybe to come to some of these big tournaments that you guys host. Right. So what would you tell that parent? How do I get my kid who's 15, 16, good player, really good high school player, but wants to maybe just expand it a little bit. Like how can they be seen? How can they attend one of these showcases? How can they get in front of, you know, the hundred scouts? Because 
it's not happening in their hometown, wherever they're growing up, their current team they're on is not competitive enough to take them to these larger events to be seen. What would you say to the parents of that kid who's looking to kind of take that next step as he's getting into that high school age? Like where, where what is the advice you'd give them to, to go out there and, and be a part of these events you're speaking on? Yeah, definitely is. I mean, first, just keep working to perfect your craft. And then you have we do have showcases all across the country that you don't have to be on a top team to sign up for. You can go sign up and get evaluated and start building that profile to where that player profile to where you can be seen. Um, You know, we take we take all the, the hard numbers and post those and those things are monitored. They're tracked. We rank, we start, um, in high school, we start ranking our players. We do a 200, a top 250. Um, we do follows, we do high follows. We're basically, Hey, these kids are athletes, you know? Um, and then just, you know, keep working hard, attend the showcases. And a lot, I do see a lot of times that people will not be on a competitive travel ball team, um, but the kid is an absolute athlete. He attends a showcase. Um, our, our great scouting team that we have a perfect game that the talk starts happening. Um, they get invited to a national showcase, which I'm actually headed off to, um, Friday. We have our 13 U and 14 U national showcases, which is only, it's basically the invitational for showcases. So basically only the top kids that we've seen across the country at these local showcases get invited to that. And then we take those 13 U national showcases and 14 U national showcases and we select our select festival teams, which are basically the top 40 kids at the 13 and 14 U age group. And I, a lot of times I see that kind of snowball a, a, a young kid's baseball career because the next thing you know is you're going to have those top teams wanting your kid to come play with them just because they're getting that kind of follow that kind of recognition. And they know that you can help their team win. And, and this leads me to, to one of my last points before I let you go. And again, Tony Harper, a perfect game. Thank you. Uh, this, this conversation, we, we pride ourselves here on you think of really trying to, to cover the entire sports spectrum, you know, from the local level, all the way to the, to the highest of competition and whatnot, where you guys would kind of fall on that spectrum. So I appreciate you coming on and kind of explaining a little more of, what you guys are about, as opposed to everyone just always listening to me tell our crazy weekend stories. Everything you just said, the reality is requires a lot of resources, right? I mean, when we, when we take our kid down to, to Florida, we're fortunate that for five days to stay in a hotel and fly down there and bring, you know, all of our other children and eat and travel. And these are multi thousands of dollars a weekend to go do this. And for some of these teams, they're traveling out of town, especially the older teams, five, six, seven times a year. I mean, this is a huge, huge commitment. So what, what are things that both perfect game, just the youth sports community can do? Like, how do we allow this to be a little bit more accessible? How do we not, how do we allow this to not just be the families who can pay to fly their kid to every showcase has an inherent advantage over the families who can't, or is that just the reality of the market and a reality of just kind of the world we live in. Like, how do you guys address those kind of those realities and say, okay, what we do is great, but it is, it's, it's very expensive. It, it costs a lot of money. It's not easy for everyone. Like, how do you, how do you guys kind of internalize that? Yeah. You know, it is, it is tough because at the end of the day, yep. it is a business. Um, and we, you know, we got to make revenue. Um, but we are constantly working on ways to cut the cost on some of these events to allow the the teams because there's a lot of talented players out there that just can't swing it. And, and those kids, those kids deserve yep. to be seen, too. So we actually have um, we have a foundation It's called the Perfect Game Cares Foundation, where we basically we we raise funds to help those athletes, to allow them to put them into a showcase, to give them to the experience to um, be able to be seen. Um, we have our select festivals coming up where all those top players are s selected or sent to go out and fundraise for that foundation. We make it a competition for the kids and it's fun for the kids that are selected to that to really understand, you know, Hey, you're a great athlete, but there's more than to this game than just, you know, being a great athlete. Like we, we really want to steal the foundation in these young athletes to, Hey, give back to your community, be a bigger cause, 
Um, like just this past year, I had a parent reach out to me um, in the North Charleston, South Carolina area. And they had a uh, high school baseball, um, their high school baseball team folded because they didn't have the funds. So I reached out to Jennifer Ford, who is, uh, she is over our Perfect Game Cares Foundation. And we supplied their whole team with uniforms, baseball equipment. Um, we flew out ex major league baseball players to surprise them. And it's, you know, it's not all about the dollar signs. I mean, I know people say, oh, you know, PG does this, PG does this. Well, you know, we like to give back just as much as, you know, we generate revenue. And I think it's very important that those kids that don't have the opportunity, they do get the opportunity because, you know, there's a lot of uh, impoverished areas that, you know, kids just can't afford it. So we do have means to where, you know, if, if there's someone out there that thinks they, you know, they sh- they really want to attend a showcase and we can swing it, we'll we'll definitely we'll back them on that. We'll get them to an event. Um, you know, we attend our scouts, they talk, they see high local high school events. So yeah, I mean, playing in perfect game, it it can definitely speed up the process, but there's other means of getting to the draft. It's not, hey, if you don't play perfect game, you're not getting drafted because that's that's not true. I mean, if you're a top kid, you're going to get seen. Yeah, especially in today's world with social media and the ability to to share content and videos. It, I think that's a good point. I, mean, I think it's important to give you guys that opportunity because, again, and this isn't a perfect game uh, criticism. The, 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 it's a common criticism across the entire spectrum of just youth, of just youth sports in general, right? Whether you're a, a, an aspiring Olympic gymnast or you're it, whatever tennis, whatever it is, there's a lot of costs behind this kind of pursuit of playing competitive youth sports. And it's just getting more expensive and it's just getting more professionalized. Um, by the day. And again, that's not, that's not unique to baseball or unique to perfect game. That's just kind of the the market and the world that we're living in. And we see it through our conversations here on you think, um, you know, every week, the the last thing I, I, I'm curious to get your perspective on is like, what is next for perfect game? I know the, the venture into the youth sports, the younger ages down to nine, U was a kind of a big expansion, at least here locally in North Carolina. You know, when we first started doing this, there was U triple SA, there was little league, there was Dixie youth, we didn't have perfect game here in North Carolina until just the last year or two. Um, you know, so I know getting into the younger, I'm saying for the younger ages, it was around for the high school kids. So what, what is the next step for you guys? Like, where do you see your ability to grow the game? Where do you see that next kind of entry point into, into this scene? Um, you know, as you guys continue to try to expand, you know, throughout the country. So right now, like you said, we perfect game has been huge in the high school market and we just started dipping down into the youth ages. And I think right now um, we're just kind of focusing on that quality of growth, you know, making sure the the what we put out on the field is, you know, what the parents and players deserve. So we've grown pretty quick um, in different areas. Um, We just tapped into the fast pitch market. Um, so we're, we're starting that as well. Um, so that's kind of in the works. Um, but I think, you know, we have a great team, Tony Von Dalton, Darren Larson, um, all the youth guys that I work in week in, week out. Like our, our main focus is, Hey, giving these parents and kids the opportunity to play at the highest level and give them, you know, we want to be the gold standard in youth sports. And that's really what we're focusing on right now is just making sure across the country, like we're putting out that top product for kids because they deserve it. I mean, they work hard. Um, the parents spend their their dollars, you know, their their weekends off. So big shout out to the parents, because I can only imagine what it's like to work, you know, Monday through Friday and then spend eight hours at the ballpark on Saturday, Sunday. Like it's it's an absolute grind. And, you know, we definitely appreciate the parents um, for, you know, choosing perfect game. Um, but yeah, right now it's just kind of make sure, I mean, obviously we're looking at different areas. We're wanting to grow in California and kind of expand to different countries. Um, I have people message me on Instagram all the time, like, Hey, we want you here. We want you here. And it's, you know, to grow is great, but to quality grow is even better. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, just kind of focusing on, um, just putting out a better yeah. product every day. Well, I appreciate that. And again, as, as just as a dad, as someone who I don't have a baseball background, I've only gotten into baseball, 
you know, kind of through osmosis of my kids playing it, you know, through rec leagues and then entering the travel circuit. And, you know, just again, last year we experienced the all state game for the first time, never even knew it existed. Didn't even know, but it, little do we know we show up in, in Georgia and there's teams from all over the country. And those are now same families. When we were down in Florida, we played one of the teams from Texas, three or four of the families we met last year in Georgia came up to us. Hey, remember, you know, we took a picture or whatever. Their kid was playing on the Texas team. Now they're just playing on their travel kids from California. My high school, my, my college quarterback, Brock Berlin, his, my kid had a pitch against his kid. He plays in a team in Louisiana. Brock was my first ever quarterback. And here we are on a weekend playing against each other. Now we're watching our 10 year olds play against each other. Like, it's just, it, it's so cool to just how it all ties everything together. And just as a dad to, to have the, the platform and the opportunity to see my kids chase things that they're interested in and compete and learn to learn to be tough and learn to be challenged. It's uh, I applaud you guys. I mean, it's not a perfect system by any means. It, I'm sure you get a lot of feedback and criticism and whatnot, but just know you guys try to do it the right way. Um, you guys put on good events. We've always enjoyed our experiences and uh, I appreciate you joining us here on you think to kind of share a little bit about what this crazy world of travel competitive baseball could uh, could be like. Yeah, I definitely appreciate you guys having me on. Um, it's baseball is a crazy world, man. And it, you know, it just, like you said, it's kind of crazy how everything just goes full circle. And these kids, it's kind of lifelong friends on and off the field. So definitely appreciate you guys. Looking forward to seeing you guys out there next year. Hope you'll be out. Uh, we actually got a team coming from Hawaii this year in the 11s, 12s, 13s, and 14s for that oh, national wow. state event. So it's, it's cool. going to be great. Yeah. It's yeah gonna he's going to awesome. try out again. We'll see if we yeah, make it. We'll see sure. how it goes, but uh, he's going to try to do it again, but that was a great experience last year. The only problem is it the baseball season never ends. <laughs> it just, it just goes on and on. And that's a conversation for another day, but uh, I appreciate it, Tony. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, good luck on your, I'm sure you're about to fly to another part of the country for another weekend. I don't know how you do it. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the latest episode of You Think with Tony Harper from Perfect Game. Um, I, I just think it's so important that, you know, we talk about it so much to just have somebody from the organization on, be able to kind of hear from their own words, you know, what direction they see youth sports headed, um, you know, how they see their ability to grow the game, to grow the access to the game. And, um, you know, I thought it was really cool to hear him at the end mention that, you know, softball is kind of their next big play. You know, they've really dug a, a pretty firm hold on the on the baseball scene and uh you know now for them to kind of take that same model and template and bring it to you know softball which is you know a game that's just exploding every summer the women's college world series we've talked a lot about it here about how much i love watching it and how how amazing those girls are in those teams so um you know just to see them be able to now maybe take this template and 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 grow the game at the youth level for softball um i think will be fun to kind of keep an eye on and Maybe once they get that up and going, we can have them back and kind of give uh, give all you parents and coaches of, of softball players maybe a little insight into how the perfect game model works for you. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Uh, whether you're a baseball, whether your kid's a baseball kid or not, I just think there's a lot to take out of that um, out of that conversation that you can apply to other sports and and whatnot. So thanks again to Tony Harper, Perfect Game for for joining us. And now, as always, at this time, I'm going to bring in uh, Tasha, my producer, who. As always, has a bunch of questions from you guys that uh looking forward to hearing. Tasha, what's up? What's going on? Yeah, we have a couple of fun audience questions today, Greg. And seeing how you're always on the baseball field, you just talked to Tony. Um, a fan wants to know, what sport do you secretly wish your kids played so you can watch it, but they actually just don't play right now? You know, that's a, that's a pretty good question, actually. Um you know, there's a few sports that I don't understand a lot, you know, so like, for example, I go watch my daughter play soccer and and again, it's, she's young and it's rec level soccer, but you know, they're starting to introduce formations and spacing and how to kind of work the field and whatnot. And I don't have a, a, a soccer background at all. I don't understand the game. My understanding of soccer comes from playing FIFA, right? Like that's the limit of what I know about the game. So watching her and just listening to her coaches and listen to them instruct is fun learning, learning a game that's new to you. So I, I, I enjoy that she plays soccer because it keeps me, you know, learning and trying to learn so that I can come home and help her very similar to how the boys were in baseball, you know, a sport that I played as a kid, I didn't have a great background of playing at a high level. So I've learned a lot just through necessity of being able to try to help my kids and coach their teams. 
I knew I had to be open minded to, to realizing that there's a lot of people out there who know a lot more about the game than I do. And make sure you're paying attention when they talk and, and, and go out and try to find as much info as you can. So I've enjoyed learning the game. So I think it's a great question. You know, I think um, coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to dive into a little bit of the lacrosse world, um, which is a world I don't know anything about. Um, we didn't have lacrosse at our high school. You know, lacrosse in my house was like playing with my brother in the backyard, just throwing it off the wall with lacrosse sticks my dad brought home from his gym class. So that's a game that if my kids did play, um, it would be fun because it'd be like watching a completely new sport unfold. Same thing with like ice hockey. Um, not a ton of ice hockey players in Charlotte, North Carolina, I don't think. But again, a sport that's fun to watch. I don't know a lot about the the X's and O's, for lack of a better term. Like, I don't know a lot about the strategy, so that would probably be fun. So yeah, I think watching your kids play sports that you didn't play at a high level is really fun for the parents, it, you know, because you want to learn it, right? You want to share a, share a love and a share an interest and an understanding of the game your kid loves. So that's a big part of it. So I think that's a great question. So 2023 lacrosse and ice hockey. Can your kids even skate like on ice? Can my kids skate? No. Yeah. Okay. So this is just, this is just a dream. Yeah. This is all a dream. (laughs) They're not playing any of those sports anytime soon. I don't, I don't imagine we, we, we'd have a long, we'd have a long road to hoe there. We, we, uh, that, that, that wasn't, that isn't in the future. So the second question is what's the strangest thought you've had while playing or coaching? Yeah. So I guess my, my strangest thought and you know in a moment of weakness either playing or, or coaching and these are these are thoughts that i i try to limit right they you don't want these these kind of things creeping into your brain in the middle of of competing but you know there's times where you just think to yourself like why am i doing this like this is miserable this has been a complete and utter disaster and you know you, you have a little weak moment there and you're like all right we, right, we got to flush that i got to figure out a way to like get these kids through it or help my team get through it get myself through a bad moment or whatever but you know, at times you have those uh, you have those weak moments where doubt creeps in, and it's a lot easier to just walk away and call it. But thankfully, I've never actually followed through on those thoughts, and I just uh, after it creeps in, you try to kind of lock that out and and flush it and say, "All right, no, I got to figure out a way to you know get the kids through a bad inning or get the kids through a bad half or you know whatever it is." Um, because at the end of the day, as as stressful and as aggravating as it can be, it's uh, it's the best. It's good to know that people like you, as a player or coach, sometimes think like, "What am what I doing?" Am I do- this That's is I just spent si- I just spent yeah. six hours this week at practice, and this <laughs> looks like nothing we practiced. This is you know <laughs> you're just like this is a waste of everybody's time. We look ridiculous, but then somehow it all comes back together, and next thing you know, you're like, "All right, we're actually not that bad. We can do this." <laughs> Okay, so the final last fan question is, if this podcast wasn't about sports, what other topic can you talk about for hours? I don't think I'm knowledgeable about any other topics to talk about for hours. Really? <sighs> I, I don't know. I not I mean not ca- even yeah, karaoke? So karaoke songs, that's a given. Um you know, I'm fairly well versed in like politics, but I'm not I have zero interest in diving into that disaster of a sewer dump. Um, and and dealing with all that nonsense. So yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything, uh, that I'm interested enough or knowledgeable enough in to, uh, to spend this amount of time talking about. So I'm going to stick to, uh, I'm going to stick to this for now because I think this is about it. Yeah. So sticking to sports, but once again, thank you guys so much for all your listener questions. You can submit them on TikTok, Instagram, or Twitter. 